Yeah. Well, good morning and welcome to service this morning. Wherever you find yourselves this morning, I'm glad uh, that you're tuning in with us. Um, as we prepare our hearts uh, for some worship this morning, um, our call to worship is Psalm 43. And um, as we reflect upon the details of our past week, whether they're good or bad, our call to worship this morning reminds me that no matter what circumstances I find myself in, I can choose to praise the Lord. And uh, so I'll just read Psalm 43. Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfair nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by my enemy? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. I will praise with the lyre. O God, my God, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. start with open up the heavens we've waited for this day we're gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing
Gracious God, we are the church united as we pray from different locations, connected through something more marvelous than technology. We're connected by your spirit, filling us with hope and peace. We come first of all with thanksgiving. Thank you for the many kindnesses we have experienced in this time of social distancing. Old friends reconnecting, some households learning about togetherness, others learning new quieter rhythms. Thank you for the summer season, the signs of growth and blossoms, and the many bounties collected from gardens. We thank you for the rains. We ask for Lord more. We ask for more, Lord. Even as there is much to be thankful for, we come together with lament, Lord. There is much unrest around the world, with COVID cases hitting record highs, some countries facing another shutdown, while others are continuing on with the business as usual. Give wisdom to our politicians, Lord. Unity among the different levels of government. Help them to find the balance between opening our economy and safeguarding public health. We continue to pray for a vaccine for the virus. Give insight to researchers and cooperation among nations so that all can benefit from scientific breakthroughs. The virus has caused much loss of life around the world. So many are suffering. So many families grieve. And we don't know when it will end. And so, Lord, we lay these burdens at your feet, whether it be financial concern or fear of the unknown or guilt for foiled trips or feeling overwhelmed by the daily grind of life. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand, Lord, as your word instructs. And we cast all our cares upon you. Please help us to leave them at your feet and find rest in you. So often we come to you with our burdens, but then when we're done praying, we pick them all back up. We know this is not what you desire, Lord. Your word in Matthew tells us to come to you, all who are labored and heavy laden, and you will give us rest. We willingly take your yoke upon us now, Lord, for your yoke is easy. Thank you for the gift of your word, Lord, that continues to guide and direct us. Keep us healthy and help us care for each other. Jesus, I pray that you would walk with us this week. We trust in you because you have been there for us, showing us the faithful path. Amen.
If you're going to rob a bank, then now's the time, right? After all, masks are mandatory in public places, so how amazing is that for, you know, for bank robbers, that you just walk into a bank wearing your mask along with everyone else and no one else um, suspects a thing. So if you're a bank robber, then this is your time. Seriously, though, we have become a city of mask wearers, right? And we're all mask experts as well. Masks versus no masks, three layers, N N95, medical, non-medical, masks with a window, homemade, cotton, reusable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's, and there's also mask etiquette, right? Don't touch it, don't adjust it. Uh, where do you hang it where it's, when it's not being used? Um, now, for me, masks, are confusing because I like to take selfies, but when I'm taking a selfie during COVID, do I say cheese? Because I sometimes say that and then I think it through afters and think that's really rather silly. Anyway, even I have to start thinking, okay, what am I eating prior to wearing a mask? Because if I've just eaten onions or garlic and that poor nose is stuck with that mouth for the next two hours, then I need to be planning ahead, right? But there's a way as well that I find that 
the anonymity that the mask affords is, is, rather com- is rather comforting. I can walk into a grocery store and not talk to anyone. You know, if I don't want to, I, I just walk in and walk out. I have a new... I have a renewed respect for our frontline workers who wear these masks and PPE all shift long because at the end of Walmart, at the end of shopping, I am just through with masks. I just want to take it off and breathe. I just want to expose my real face to the real world and not have to hide it behind a layer of fabric anymore. Next week, I'm on vacation for two weeks. Woohoo! And then we will have a special message from our national superintendent, Steve Elliott. And then after that, we will be starting um, a series in the Psalms. So this is our last um, message in Esther, carving a legacy from chaos. Now to recap, through uh, Xerxes, um, we learned that as we we admit that we're broken, that God can turn us, God can make us into something beautiful. So honesty is how we start carving a legacy out of chaos. Where are we located? It's not about finding ourselves. It's about locating ourselves in God's story. And then the week after that, we learned... (sighs) from Vashti, that to carve a legacy from chaos, we need to do what is right and not what is easy. Mordecai, the week after that, showed us that to carve a legacy from chaos, we need to get serious with sin, right? Mordecai felt the ripple effect of someone's sin 500 years after the fact. And then last week, we learned that if we are to carve a legacy from chaos, then we need to know what hill we are willing to die on. And I said that Jesus calls each of us to follow him up his hill so that we can die to ourselves. And then this week, we finally get to look at Esther. Esther, the queen of Persia. Esther, the savior of the Jews. But also Esther, the wearer of masks. Esther, the owner of a secret identity. You see, Esther chapter 2 verse 7 tells us that her name is Hadassah. But she's also known as Esther. And this identity crisis is sort of at the heart of Esther's story. Because it's only as she uh, resolves this internal conflict, it's only as Esther takes off her mask and exposes her true self to the world that God can use her as he wants to. And so this morning, we will learn from Esther the final step in carving a legacy from chaos. Knowing who you, whose you are, know whose you are, and know why you are. Let's say it all together. Know whose you are, and know why you are. Okay, Kate's about to read to us this moment of Esther's um, awakening, Esther's transformation uh, in Esther chapter 4, when, when the mask finally comes off. Now, to lead us up to this moment, we, we should know that Mordecai has heard about Haman's plan to wipe out the Jews, and through a messenger called Hathak, Mordecai tells Esther, who's in the harem, about Haman's plan, and, and he tells her to go and plead with the king for the lives of the Jews. So let's read from Esther chapter 4, verse 10. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death, unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back the answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa. Fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Okay, this is the passage that shows Esther taking off her mask, right? 
Up until this moment, she's been at the mercy of forces outside of her, her control. She's been living a rather passive life, right? Um, she was, uh, you know, here are some examples. Uh, she was born into exile, far from home. She had no choice of that. Her parents, they both died. She had no choice of that. She was raised by her cousin. She had no choice over that. Zero control over any of these. And we all have these realities, right? Things that we didn't choose, where we were born, when we were born, uh, how we were raised, where we were, were raised, medical conditions, etc., etc. Things that we don't have any control over. Now, I remember uh, doing ministry in this open concept co-ed prison in El Salvador. And I remember meeting this little girl uh, who was called Mariposa, who was actually born into captivity. She was born into prison. This, the, the, these walls were all that she'd ever known. She had no idea what freedom looked like. Uh, and, and she was in this place due to forces outside of her control, like Esther. And then, you know, as if to add insult to injury, we find that Mordecai forbids her to reveal her true identity as a Jew in chapter 2, verse 10. And then, and then, and then Scripture tells us that she is taken into the king's palace and she's entrusted to, to Haggai in the harem. She's in the care of Shashkaz in 2.14. And then chapter 2, verse 15 tells us when her turn came. And then it says that she's made queen after impressing the king with her very, um, very particular set of skills. So notice the words that we're reading here, right? That she's forbidden, she's taken, she's entrusted to, she's in the care of, her turn came, she's made. This is Esther looking rather passivated, not activated, but passivated. And then even after becoming queen, we are told in Esther chapter 2, verse uh, verse. Verse 20, it says that she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. So even as queen over the Persian Empire, she's still Mordecai's little girl. She's still accepting the status quo. But then in chapter 4, something changes. Something shifts within her. Okay, listen to her words in chapter 4, verse 15. It says, Esther then sent this reply to Mordecai. Go. And gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Who is Esther to be talking to Mordecai like that? What's happened to Esther? What's, you know, what's happened to the old Esther? There is a change in tone here. It's no longer Mordecai giving her the orders. It's Esther giving Mordecai his marching orders. Esther has been activated. Now, if you are someone who has largely taken a, a, a passive stance in life, then I want you to listen up. If you have simply done what you've done because it was expected of you, then I want you to listen up. Friends, entire people groups don't get saved because individuals do simply as they are told. Evil systems like communism or Nazism don't get taken, out, taken down because people are compliant. An empire built on slavery did not end this practice because William Wilberforce did what he was told. Civil rights do not spring out of thin air. It takes the activation of people like Rosa Parks and MLK and many, many others. And this is where it gets real. You see, for change to come, we need to have a godly, Bible-based rejection of what society tells us we should do if and when society comes into conflict with the word of God. We need to say a sanctified no to the status quo. We need to be activated. Friends, your home life won't change if you don't make the change. Your, your teens won't give up their phone addictions simply by you wishing it was so. Your marriage won't improve if you just let things slide and take the path of least resistance. 
Your work or your business won't improve by you taking a passive stance. Your garden won't weed itself. Your family members won't get saved by you simply hoping it happens. For any positive change to take place, someone needs to do something. And so within Esther, there has been a tectonic transformation. There has been a seismic shift. Esther was, head, was, 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 was handed a life that was chaos. And yet she grabbed that hammer and that chisel and she started the hard work of carving a legacy herself. And do you know what led to her picking up the chisel and hammer? Do you know how you can carve a legacy from chaos? Chapter 4, verse 14. We need to know whose we are and we need to know why we are. You need to know whose you are and you need to know why you are. You see, Esther's U-turn took place in, in uh, Esther chapter 4, verse, four verse, verse, verse 13, when Mordecai said to her, do, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Okay, notice his words. This man who had previously ordered her to keep her identity as one of the covenant people of God a secret is now telling her to own this identity. This is the moment, Esther, for you to stop hiding your light under a bushel. This is the time for you to take off your mask and to be true to whose you are. And I love this because even though Esther is in exile, even though she's part of the group who chose not to go back to the homeland when they had the opportunity, even though she has no access to the temple or to worship, you know, um, even though she's compromised morally when, when she joined the harem and uh, married Xerxes, even though she's lived this false life all her life, even though all of this is true, it's not too late. It's not too late for Esther. She can still carve a legacy for God's glory from chaos. Amen. And I love that because that is at the heart of the gospel. That is the heart of the gospel. Now, from what I can see uh, in the entire book of Esther, uh, chapter 4, verse 13 to 14, are the only recorded words from Mordecai to Esther, okay? It's the, it, it, it's the only time that we see what they actually said to each other. And what is it that Mordecai tells her? He says, it is time for you to take your mask off. It is time to know whose you are. You are a Jew. You are one of God's covenant people, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. This is your heritage, Esther. This is your, your identity. Friends, I know what it's like to try to pretend to be someone that I'm not. When I was at university, I chose to compromise my relationship with Jesus. I had one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. And let me tell you this, it was miserable. And it was only when I repented and I settled in my heart whose I was that I knew peace once again. Psalm 86 verse 11 says this. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Friends, our hearts need uniting. They need stitching back together. And the needle and thread to stitch our hearts back together is God's truth. Teach me your way, O Lord. I reject my own way. I choose to walk in your truth. I, 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 I choose to walk in whose I am. I choose to know whose I am. And so if you are spiritually compromised right now, then you need to rediscover whose you are. Okay, from... Esther 1 verse 1, or Esther chapter 2 verse 1, when, you know, when she first uh, turns on, shows up on the scene. So from Esther 2 verse 1, or whatever it is, to Esther 4 verse 13, even though Esther was the queen of Persia, she had no purpose. She was going with the flow. She'd accepted the status quo. She's a passive observer to her own life. She's a passive observer to her own life. And it was only when she knew whose she was that she was free to discover 
why she was, her reason for existing. Verse chapter 4, verse 14 says this, And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Friends, when your heart is united in fearing God's name, something incredible happens to you. Okay? What happens is that you start to look back over your life at all the circumstances that have led you to this very point, And you start wondering, God, were you in that circumstance? Were you there that, in, that, in, that, in that circumstance, that thing that I've always brushed off as coincidence or happenstance? Was that actually you? And were you using that so that I would end up here? Now, like Esther in verse 14, we might never know. But in the world of Esther 4 verse 14, who knows? Who knows? Maybe. Was it happenstance that I joined a missionary ship when my spiritual life was in ruins in 2001? Was it chance that I met Wendy from Canada and fell in love with her? Was it coincidence that she's from North Gore and that Cornerstone under the leadership of Craig Peters chose to take a chance on us with no official experience or training? And then you look at all the moments and the serendipities and the near misses and the circumstances and the coincidences and the chance run-ins between that moment and now. And could it be that I've come to this position for such a time as this? Who knows? And it's not just pastors, you know, who get to ask this. You can do this with your own life. You can look back at your circumstances and say, God, were you there? Was that you? And this, my friends, is the joy of knowing why you are. And this is the moment. This is the moment when, when your family that drains you and exhausts you and frustrates you suddenly becomes your mission field. This is the moment where the workplace where you've been merely putting in the hours, punching in and punching out, suddenly becomes your mission field. What was a cul-de-sac or a dead end is now alive with the heavenly possibilities of maybe. Who knows? Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear Mordecai's words, who knows but that you have come, I find that so much more compelling than, than, you know, than a clear statement. You know, Mordecai could have said, Esther, it's clear that God has brought you into this position to save the Jews. But he doesn't. Instead, he leaves the possibility hanging in the air. Friends, Esther wasn't essential. Mordecai is clear in verse 14. He says, um, he says, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. She would have been the end of the line. Friends, God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He didn't need Esther. He's not sat up there in heaven wringing his hands saying, I hope they say yes. Please let them say yes. All of God's plans do not hinge on you choosing to get involved. You can choose to say no to God. You can choose self, self-preservation. You can choose the sideline. You can choose to keep on wearing that mask. But know this, if this is your choice, then God will sideline you and he will find someone else who will do the job. But what God offers you is, is an opportunity to join him and to, to know the adventure and the joy of who knows, but that you have come to this position for such a time as this. Friends, you can choose to be part of the continued chaos of this world or you can ally yourself with God. You can submit to him, you can pledge your allegiance to him and you can join him in his workshop, working alongside him, part of a cause that is greater than yourself carving a legacy from chaos. And so a life following God is, is one of offering him your yes and then offering him your next yes and then the yes after that and, and thus embracing the continued possibility of who knows. 
And friends, what is true for Esther, what is true for you, and what is true for me is also true for Cornerstone, right? Like, we know whose we are. We are Christ's. We are his church on mission for him. And so the question right now, this moment in time, is not whose we are, but why we are. What is God's specific calling for us as a church during this next season? Is it simply to wait until we can have 6556 Prince of Wales Drive open again for normal services? Is that what our calling is? You see, our leadership met this week and we decided that we're done with watching and waiting. We no longer simply want to wait for church to start up again. We are through with wait and see, wait and see. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, well, open up the church again. Let's have services. We can meet in groups of 100 outside. We can have, eight, we can have 30% of our capacity inside, which is about 80 people. So just have, have services again. Have church again. But let me ask you this. What would Sunday morning look like with social distancing, with signing in and out with your name and your address and your phone number? with mandatory masks, with no singing, with no children's ministry, with no communion, with turning people away because we're maxed out. What would church on a Sunday morning look like with, with one-way systems, having only wash, one washroom available and having to sanitize it after every time it's used? What would church on a Sunday morning look like if we had to sanitize the whole of the building ahead of time and again after the service? And even with all of that, even with all of those systems and structures and precautions in place, there is still the very real risk of Cornerstone being responsible for spreading COVID in our community. And then if that happens, then who does the, you know, the track and trace and the calling and the informing, who does that? And so instead of Charging ahead with all that, we're asking this question, what if God has called us to this position for such a time as this? Okay, let's, let's look at what we have. Let's, look, let's take stock. We now have an online presence that we didn't have before. We, we have these discussion questions, which I create every week. We have worship leaders that God has blessed us with. We have New technology, which, which we've been in, investing in over these past weeks and months and, and are still investing in now. We have new expressions of, of community, which are already being fostered in some of our homes and on some of our front lawns. And we have the ongoing continued financial giving from you guys that has been uh, faithful and sacrificial. And so we look at all of this and rather than saying, well, let's open up church again and have some kind of semi-service. Instead, we're asking, could it be that we are in this position for such a time as this? Could Esther 4 verse 14 be our story? Could Cornerstone be a 414 church? And so instead of waiting to reopen, we're now asking, who knows, but that we have come to this position for such a time as this. And so as church leadership, over this past week, we made a commitment that we will not be reopening our church building for large gatherings until the start of December at the earliest, at which point we will revisit it and look. Instead, what we're going to do is far more exciting we're going to give God our next yes, and then we're going to give him our next yes after that. Now, we know that the future is not certain, but we do believe in a covenant honoring God who works in and through our circumstances, even when we don't understand, right? And so, in August, after my vacation, we're going to start to flesh out the idea of Church 414. A church for such a time as this. Now, Church 414 is a model of house churches where clusters of cornerstoners um, 
will gather on Sunday mornings or Saturday nights or Wednesday evenings, whatever, whatever works for that particular cluster, um, in homes around the community with the purpose of worshipping together through our online service like we're doing now, and then joining around the meal table and discussing the message and praying for each other and our community. Church 414 is the next chapter in Cornerstone's history. And just like Esther, what I'm asking you to do is to join me in taking a step of faith. And like Esther said, we're going to do this. And if we perish, we perish. If we fail, we fail. But I'd rather be pastoring a church who tries and fails than a church that sits and waits. Amen. And so over these next two weeks, when we don't have online cornerstone services, when you're, when you're going elsewhere, I want you to start preparing yourself for Church 414. I want you to start preparing to open your hearts and your homes to the idea of a group of cornerstoners and even maybe your neighbors to, to meet at your place and your house becoming a place where others can experience fellowship and hospitality and mission and renewed purpose, where they can find out whose they are and why they are. You see, we all live surrounded by people who need saving, who need rescuing, who need Jesus. We, we live right, right next door to the lost and the broken, and we live across the road from sinners and the spiritually hungry. And so I want homes across North Gore and Metcalf and Osgood and Kempville and Ottawa and Manatic to be transformed into centers of light and hope in the midst of darkness. That we would start carving out our legacy from chaos. Esther transitioned from living life passively to living life actively for the glory of God. And God is ready to mobilize you because he knows that mobilized people mobilize people. And God is ready to activate you because he knows that activated people activate people. He knows that disciples make disciples. And God wants to activate you. He wants to mobilize you. And so friends, I'm, I'm, I'm through with waiting for church to reopen. And instead, we need to start realizing that the church, us, has always been open. And I'm done with pining after community. Instead, we're going to create community. And I'm done with checking my news feed every day to see what latest chaos has erupted around the world. And instead, I think it's time that we as a church put our money where our mouth is, as it were. That we as Cornerstone has become not only listeners of the word, but doers of the word. It's time that we started carving a legacy from chaos. Our legacy, Christ's legacy, and the legacy of those who will come to Christ through our witness. Because who knows, right? But that we are where we are in this place, in this moment, in this time, for such a time as this. Let's pray. Lord, your word says that uh, unless... The Lord builds the house. The uh, you know the people labor in in vain, and so we recognize that uh, we cannot go forward unless you are leading us. And Lord, I I I I truly believe that Church Four One Four is your idea. That Lord, you are looking for not just for Cornerstone to reopen, but you're looking for a church for such a time as this. A church that lives out Esther 4, verse 14. So I pray, Lord, that, uh, that you, you would go ahead of us that, uh, and that you would make our way plain before our face. And that, Lord, we would see you doing a new work. We would see you carving a legacy for your name and for your glory from chaos. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we just learned whose we are. 
we are yours and you are with us. Our last song today, Lord, um, the lyrics are exactly what you are wanting us to live out. It's a wonderful reminder of um, your walk, Lord. It tells us that you dined with sinners and saints. You healed the blind, the lost, and the lame. And even now, you're in our midst. So moving forward, Lord, as we launch this new venture of Church 414, God, I pray that these words would quicken to our hearts as we move forward with you in this new venture. Amen. He who was before there was light walked across the pages of time.
this week with the words uh, Paul from Romans 15 verse 13 may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit have a wonderful week God bless